I realized there's one thing, and I didn't know this, that inside you right now is greatness. And our job to, is to get in alignment with, with for God and to let it activate and to realize that it's not supposed to be perfect. If I want things to change, I gotta make things change in my life by letting go of the things that are holding me back. Hello, and thank you for joining our podcast, Hope to Recharge, a show that is designed to bring hope, inspiration, motivation, and some practical tips to those that are battling depression and anxiety, and to those that are supporting loved ones that are going through the journey in this difficult time of depression and anxiety. I'm here to tell you, you are not alone, and we will live beyond depression and anxiety. We will share our stories one story at a time in a world of mental health together is better. I'm your host, Matana. Thank you for tuning in. Before we continue, I would like to announce our sponsor, BetterHelp.com. I myself just started with BetterHelp.com. I'm excited to start with my new therapist. It's going to be very convenient for me because I travel a lot. I also have some time in the evenings that I can work and most therapists do not see past 8 p.m. BetterHelp.com is an online platform over 4,000 therapists and you can choose the one that is matching for you. It's affordable. It's accessible. It's convenient. It's secure. You can text them. You can chat with them. You can video call them. You can use your tablet, your computer, your phone. It's on the tip of your fingers. You don't have to travel anywhere. If you're remote and you're looking for a therapist, then maybe your community doesn't have someone local that is specific therapist for what you need. Why not sign up on betterhelp.com and get the therapist that fits your needs. It's also super private. You don't have to go anywhere and be seen in public if you're still struggling with stigma. So visit betterhelp.com. That's betterhelp.com forward slash hope to recharge. They're offering our listeners 10% off on their first month. So go to betterhelp.com forward slash hope to recharge. Find your therapist. Hello, and thank you for joining me here on Hope to Recharge, a place that we are going to break the stigma around depression and anxiety, bring more awareness to mental health, bring more support, love and communication, and together is better mental health. Today, I have somebody that I think I wrote down in my list 100 of people that I want to um, interview before I even started. A year before I started my podcast, I made a list of who I'm going to interview. And the person that I'm about to introduce was on that list. And I'm so grateful that he gave me time. Tony Grebmeyer. Welcome to the show. Thank you for giving me your time. Ah, I'm honored and it's, it's going to be great. I'm super excited and thanks for letting me be on your top 100 list. We can cross it off and add somebody else. <laughs> do we cross it off the top 100 or do we say achieved? Like, I think, I think it's something to look at and reflect on and saying what you visualized in your head, I call that fantasy. Mm -hmm. um, putting it down on paper mm -hmm. uh, is possibility. And, and it's something that you share with people that it becomes an even a stronger possibility. And then there's steps or space that needs to happen in between possibility and reality. And so mm. you're making it a reality and certain steps and things had to happen. So congratulations, right. because most people skip that because they have a fantasy and they never put anything towards it. And then they'll never have their reality come true. Yeah. So that's a very good point. And you're, we're going to share about that because you have so much to say about different achievements. But I just want to give the background why I wanted you on my show. I don't remember who introduced us. I really don't remember what it, it was definitely business related. I don't remember if I met you at an event or somebody introduced us from an event, but it was definitely something business related. And the, oh, I know what it was. You were on the ClickFunnels podcast and the only one I listened to, the only one. The only one that's a good thing and a bad was thing. you. The only one you had with the, the one with David was with you. And I remembered I was so inspired. And the reason why I was inspired was yes, you're a businessman. You made you you're an entrepreneur. You're you you're a serial entrepreneur. You're always thinking about something else, something new. You're were on the Inc. top hundred um fastest growing businesses for many years, right? You you Yeah, we've we've been honored uh over the last six consecutive years to make the Inc. 5000 uh, six times. So it's been, it's such a great honor. Uh, That's huge. Yeah. That's huge. 
So I remember all that. And there was a lot of other achievements. But one of the, the things that struck me was three things that you keep on saying, I'm a dad, I'm a husband, I'm a friend. That's how you introduce yourself. You don't say, oh, I'm a, a CEO and co-founder of a ship offer that is on the top 5,000 best growing businesses. That comes later on the list. And you also talk about your recovery very openly, very, in, in a very humble way. And you speak about your journey that never, ever, ever, ever ends. And those things stuck with me. It just stuck with me that this is such a real, real human being. He's not like, oh, look at me. I'm so powerful. No, I achieved greatness, but I also had a lot of failures. But my failures are not failures because I learned from them and I'm constantly learning from them and I'm paying it forward that others should know that we're not perfect. We fail, we rise above, we can always change always change, never give up. And that is your life mission, your life mission. And the latest thing that was amazing by me was your new project, the Be Fulfilled Project, which I want to get into in this episode. So you're a super, super achieved person, but you're more achieved internally for me than in the in the materialistic world. And and your journey, when you talk about your depression, your your ups and downs, your recovery from addiction, and that is your major focus in life. So it was, I said, I need to have this guy on my show. I need to get more of his time. I need to get more of his insights. I need to, I need to grow and I need to, um, I need to hear what he did to make that shift. No, I love it. And, and such an honor. My mom uh, will listen to this and she'll love the fact that you said those things about me. My mom lives six months out of the year in the UK and six months in Vegas. And my goal is every single day is to wake up and call my mom because I know one day I won't. Mm. Every and, day? What'd you say? Every day? You every day. I, that's my goal. Wherever I'm at in the world, my goal is to call my mom every single day and just check in. My mom was my first mentor, my role model. She worked three jobs to put food on the table for my sister and myself. Uh, I grew up in a Jewish household. Um, I watched my mom figure out how to deal with adversity when my father left my mom. Uh, I was less than three months old when my mom and my dad split. Uh, my dad ended up being gay and left my mom. So Oh my God, I didn't know that. So my mom in the 70s Ooh. had to figure out how to keep us kind of in somewhat of some normalcy because everybody else around us had the the perfect kind of white picket fence life. You know, mm -hmm. two cars, husband, wife, two kids, nice house. Mm -hmm. Here was the single lady in the neighborhood trying to figure out how to juggle life and everything that was being thrown on a teacher's salary. Um, I just admire my mom. So when you were saying those things, I was thinking about, I had my, a conversation with my mom this morning and we were, we were talking about my sister and she's going through life and all the fun stuff that happens with the things we face on a daily basis. And I'm just, I, I'm reminded that it's my obligation to, to show up the way I show up because there was a time in my life that I wasn't showing up the way I choose to today. And once somebody showed me what was possible, I had a choice and a decision to make on a daily basis. And that's available for everybody, right? Up until blank, I wasn't that way. And then in the moment I decided I wanted to do something different. Now I know better. So I need to do better. Mm. And, and you feel like when you had that switch was rock bottom that you said, okay, no more? Yeah, I mean, like October 9, 2008, that's a day it'll live forever. It's, it's, it's the start of the rebirth or the, or the renewing of who I am as a human being and how I, I show up. Um, uh, I was literally suicidal, wanted to take my life. Um, I was separated from my wife for three years. Uh, you know, I was addicted to six to seven different types of drugs. I was literally a million dollars in debt, uh, living in an apartment, windows were pulled. Like I was in the lowest of lows, the darkest of darkness and no light from anywhere could get in. Um, except there was a crack and, um, you know, my higher power God sent, um, a phone ringing. Uh, I was sitting on my couch about to take my life and my buddy said, I'm coming to see you. And I said, all right, I'm like crap, now I got to put everything away. So I put everything away, sat for a few more minutes and he knocked on my door and he gave me a big hug. And his name's John Monazeri. And he said, you know, Tony, your life has meaning and purpose, but what you're doing right now doesn't. Um, wow. And I let that really weigh in and listen for about 40 some odd minutes. And I was like, you know, basically in my head, are you done? I get it. Go. Okay. Crap. You just ruined my plans. Mm -hmm. And 
he left and I kind of was left with myself, right? And I was a little numb and I was starting to feel some things. A couple of days later, my, my pastor um, came by and he shared with me some things and he said, you know, Tony, there's some good that's going to come from where you're at right now. It's really hard, but you have such a powerful message and I envision and I can see you being able to share your message on stages and around the world and doing stuff to give back. I just know it like it's inside you. Um, you know, I, I'm Christian, you know, gone to church. He said, when we built the church, we used to throw rocks with your name on it into the foundation of people we prayed for. Um, and I, and I, I say all these things because no matter who's listening today or where you're at in your journey, um, there's people praying for you that you are going to get better, that you're going to do the work and overcome uh, whatever ailments or challenges you're facing. Um, that's what I love about prayer is that the person doesn't need to know I'm praying for them. I can pray for them regardless. But and is I can, that humbling to you to know that, that that's what they did? That what? That that's what they did, that they actually took time for you? And oh, yeah. I learned at a like gas me? station. I, I was filling up my car with gas in Santa Clarita, California, and a gentleman, uh, Steve, uh, was at the gas pump next to me. And I was just filling up my car kind of in my own life and in my own lane, gone through kind of all this stuff that I've been going through. And he says, hey, I just want to let you know we've been praying for you. Wow. And I'm like, thank you. What have you been praying? Like anything good? <laughs> like, you know? And uh, one thing led to another. Um, yeah, I just started watching things shift a little bit. My wife and I didn't end up getting back together until um, later in December of 08. Um, my mom, as I mentioned, um, was the person who 12-stepped me to really get some clarity about where I was at and what I was doing with my life on 12, 14 of 08, I'd called my mom. I was working on a project and, you know, I wanted my mom's blessing and just ask her some questions. And 44 minutes into the conversation, I finally said to my mom out loud, I need help. Wow. I, she didn't know that? I didn't know what I didn't know. I didn't know I was an alcoholic. I didn't know that I had all these struggles that like were obvious to everybody else. You know, I think we mask so much of our pain. And mm -hmm. the, the reality is, is people can see what we're going through. We just can't. Uh, yet. Um, and we think, wow, you know, we're so alone. And uh, that's why I love what you're doing. I love the fact that I get to come and talk about the things that are super important. I mean, I was sitting in a meeting of recovery today, and we were talking about personal inventory, about living in such a transparent and authentic way that, you know, at the end of the day, before I go to bed, I can retire the things that happened in my day and give blessings and, and thanks and saying, hey, you know what, I maybe live the best I possibly could. But man, I'm grateful that I was given an opportunity to reflect. Mm. Um, and so, you know, when my mom, when my mom gave me the words that I needed to hear, she's like, you know, I was married to your husband. He was an alcoholic. You know, I've seen it. I've been to recovery. The, the men and the women could help you if you would let them. Um, the very next day, I went to my very first meeting in, in the rooms and I've stayed sober ever since. So how does, how does somebody who has a complete problem mm. flip the switch and stay sober? Overnight. Yeah, um, because it was a power greater than myself. It wasn't me. It was I just made a decision that I wanted to do better. And I've decided every single day that I'm going to do better. Hmm. Did you always struggle with depression or mental health or did it? Yeah, come? I still even have moments in spots in my life and my day. I mean, with adversity, family, um, business, um, I can, you know, I can literally tell myself anything. And I think I can believe it. And there's a, there's a saying in recovery about fear, which is really false evidence appearing real. And, you know, I can literally sit on my pity pot for a while and believe those things. And I can, I can get myself depressed, but I have some tools today that I didn't have, you know, 10 plus years ago when I first walked into the rooms, I didn't know what I didn't know. Mm -hmm. And now um, I spent a lot of my time talking. If you get to know me, I'll always be reaching out. That's my, that's my support system, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm the person who's going to pick up the phone and call you and you may be busy. Send me a voicemail. I'll leave you a funny message. I'll, you know, do some weird voices for you. I just do that because it's part of what I know to, to support me and help me. And then I keep a really close inner circle of great friends, people mm -hmm. that, you know, I would do anything for, I take a bullet for them. Like I, literally love the people that I have in my life. The people mm -hmm. that I know online, I try to build great relationships with by seeing them at events, like meeting you. 
um, and spending time. I think Deanna was one of the, the first people to kind of introduce us. Mm. And, and I get to see transformation take place when you meet somebody and you're like, oh, oh my gosh, so great to see you. Mm. You know, what are you doing? How's business? Is there anything right. I can do? And I start understanding what you're about. Mm -hmm. Then I can learn myself about how I can maybe network or introduce somebody to you. And I don't need anything in return. I've got everything I need. And that's the biggest switch in my brain is that I used to lead with my wallet mm. in everything that I did, all the relationships, everything was like, where was the money? Where, you know, where was the, the monetary gain? Mm. And the biggest thing that I realized by leading that is it fills up, looks pretty good, nice and fat, right? It's, mm -hmm. You can see there's some depth to it. But if there was nothing more behind it than just to make money, that it'll eventually become empty and meaningless and nothing lasts wow. that way. So instead, I flip the switch and now I lead with my heart and my heart fills up and the joy that I bring to myself and to others and I get to see it on a daily basis. And then also by doing good and spreading good cheer and positivity and helping people to see their blind spots and helping people to recover and showing people there's a better path, I've done well for myself by realizing that no matter where we're at in our journey, um, we can get better and we can improve. And so I just lead today with my heart and I, I make some money along the way. I'm happy um, doing what I get to do because I got out of bed today for contribution. I didn't get out of bed to be selfish and self-centered like I used to be. Did you learn that from the 12 steps program? Yeah, I learned it from that. But I think you know, back up for a quick little visual. So anybody listening today, so I, I grew up in a Jewish household. Um, my parents, when they divorced, my dad converted back to Catholicism. I ended up living with my dad for a period of time and went to Catholic school. I got kicked out. Um, I didn't like rules. I didn't do well when they told you to wear your uniform. I would pull like my pants off and I'd have shorts on and I'd be <laughs> in trouble. So I think I lasted eight weeks. And I told my dad, if you send me to Catholic school, I'm going to get kicked out. Mm -hmm. And then I ended up living with a Christian family who happens to be my business partner's family. Wow. And we grew up in the same neighborhood. And I lived with them for a short period of time. I got my ear pierced and my mom and I had a, a disagreement and I said, fine, I'm moving out. And she's like, you know, you need to do what you do. And so I went and lived with uh, the Roberts family for a while. And then, you know, I got into radio broadcasting and my wife walked into my world. Well, she grew up Mormon. Mm -hmm. She's Mormon. And she was practicing. Mm -hmm. So I grew up with being a Jew, Catholic, Christian, and being around a Mormon. So I took all of that kind of stuff and I put it into a Vitamix blender and hit puree. And I just believe there's got to be more to this world than you and me. Right. And there's too many things uh, in history that point to, man, I just want to do good. I just want to help people. And so that's the, been the biggest manifestation in my mind and in my life is how do I take everything that I've seen, knowing you and I were talking prior to the podcast about mm, what I call life's dumpster. Mm -hmm. I've taken everything that I've done, all the relationships, the good stuff, the bad stuff, and thrown it in this dumpster. And everybody in my life is in front of the dumpster. And I'm pushing this into them. Mm. So when I was, you know, not succeeding, failing, my marriage was apart, my kids, my relationships, everything was kind of like chaotic and crazy. I was in the dumpster. Mm. I was mm. in the dumpster mm -hmm. looking for something like hope, you know, if I could make more money or if I could only do this, I could fix it. And I needed to get outside of the dumpster. Mm -hmm. I needed to actually realize, man, I, I, I need to spend some time and figure out why these things happen. There's the patterns and they keep happening. Why? Why do they, why do they happen? That's the stuff that I've learned in my program, uh, you know, because alcohol and drugs can't hurt you unless you pick them up and put them in you. Like mm -hmm. sitting on a table at a bar, I can sit at, a, at, at the counter at a bar and not have an urge to drink. Right. The only time I have an urge is when it's in my hand and I'm saying to myself, man, that would fix everything. It's going to fix nothing. It's going to numb me for the next 10 minutes. Right. And then I'm going to be down the wrong road. So I've, I've had to do some wordsmith and play a little bit in my mind to actually flip the script that I speak and to make sure that I say things today from my heart and not from my wallet. How old were you when you went into recovery? So I will be uh, 47 in October. So uh, I'm coming up this year on 11 years of sobriety. So I was 36 years old. 
Hmm. So that's like halfway through real life. It's not no, 20. I'm to 100. Do not no, cut no, my I'm saying half. No, I meant real life, like when we're productive, you know? <laughs> like it's not when you're 20, 19. You know when you say, okay, well, I was 19, adolescent, you, you were married, children, business, partners, successes. That's, that's way into life. That's yeah, I, I, I made money too fast in my 20s and didn't know how to handle it and spend it all. Um, you know, I, I had my dad was, uh, was my real first kind of mentor that I followed. And you can have bad mentors. And I'm not saying my dad's a bad person. What I'm saying is, is my dad didn't know how to manage money. So I watched my dad make a million, lose a million, make a million, lose it. And so I followed that. And I, I literally kind of, you know, you hear it a lot in life and business, like you kind of become the people you hang around with most and mm -hmm. the people that you see you become by following them and learning about them and wanting to, you know, I always wanted to be an archaeologist. So I literally studied and I've had to flip it because I look at my mom on a teacher salary lives just a very beautiful life, but she did it with the mindset, I can do more, but I don't have to because I, I've, I've learned how to live my life sufficiently on a teacher salary. And, you know, I love the fact that my, my mom has been able to show my sister and I a beautiful example. My dad passed, um, it's coming up on six years, but my dad passed. Um, and at the very end, he didn't have anything but a little box of stuff that he kept with him all his life. I mean, mm. everything else he lost, he gave, he, right. he sold it, he, he had dementia and Alzheimer's. And so when you talk about depression and mental awareness, and these are the things that, you know, I, I'm passionate about. I'll be emceeing the walk to end Alzheimer's here in a week. And the, I'm so, you know, I want people to realize that you're not alone in your journey. There's people that are going through or have been through and you can learn from them. You can study, you can ask them questions. You can reach your hand out today and say, I need help. Those are words that I was never able to say. I was never, ever able to say, I need help. And I can't even begin to tell you my mission in life is to help empower people despite their past, despite everything they're going through or feel like, you know, the world is a big giant uh, rock, it is, but like we're getting crushed by it and we feel like we don't have any room to breathe. Our oxygen's being suffocated from us and we don't feel like there's a way out. And there is selfish and self, you know, centeredness is me wanting to take my life. Being of the mind that I am today of sound, I realize there's one thing and I didn't know this. And this is for you and this is for anybody that inside you right now is greatness. Mm. And our job to, is to get in alignment with, with for God and to let it activate and to realize that it's not supposed to be perfect. Mm. It's not who we are or why we're here. And if I can take what I've learned and I can just do what even Gandhi said, be the change you wish to see in this world. Mm -hmm. And I live in that mindset, be the change. It's not you. It's not my wife. It's not my kids. It's not my partner. It's nobody else. But Tony's job, it's obligation today when he woke up to be the best version of himself. Mm -hmm. And if I want things to change, I got to make things change in my life by letting go of the things that are holding me back. So I just know better today. I didn't know when I walked into the rooms at 36. I didn't know I was an alcoholic. Um, mm -hmm. It wasn't until I took a test online and realized I passed or failed, depending on how you look at it. I said yes to so many questions and they said, you may have a problem with alcohol. And interesting, my mom just a little while earlier had said, maybe you have a problem. And I called the only person that I knew and he said, I'll take you to a meeting. The next day I walked in and at the end of the meeting, somebody walked up to me and said, here's a book. His name's Dale. I'm still sober. So six months ahead of me in sobriety and said to me, if you take this book home and read it, it may just change your life. And what that's what I've book? tried to live every single day is, you know, do better. I know, I know, I, I know I can, and now it's just do better. So every day is an exercise of becoming the athlete of the best Tony that could be at, what was the name of the book? Oh, it's just, uh, it's just our, it's Alcoholics Anonymous. It's just our book mm. that we have. In, in oh, okay. But it's 164 pages of, you know, structured. And then there's personal stories in the back of the book. And, you know, it's less about the program and more about consistency. Mm -hmm. well, that's uh, with everything in life, right? But so many people want instant. That's why, mm -hmm. you know, microwaves are one of the top sellers at any, 
any appliance store because everybody wants it fast. You know, everybody doesn't want to boil water like they used to with a teapot mm -hmm. on the stove. They want to go put water in and hit this little instant thing. And 30 seconds later, got hot water. Like we're all in a hurry. Right. The problem is where are we trying to get? Right. We're exactly where we said we wanted to be doing exactly right. what we said we wanted to be doing until we decide we don't anymore. But I've never realized the instant. Mm -hmm. What do you think was missing inside you when you were growing up to realize that? Why did you have to go through alcohol, horrible debt, and broken relationships to figure it out? What were you missing? Love. From? You said your mother was amazing. Yeah, my mother was amazing. My father was amazing. Um, Self-love? But, well, I think that's part of it. I think some of that is is the real truth. I think... I, the, there's a piece though I'll hold out of the story so I can share it now. My dad molested me when I was like 13 years old. Oh my God. So that was my graduation present for eighth grade graduation. Wow. So one of the things why I say this, because I think it's super powerful for people to hear is I created three statements in my head when that happened. Hmm. So words like, I love you. I'm sorry and goodbye for many years were like speaking the devil's name. It was, those were the worst words you could possibly say or statements to me. To you? Yeah, to me. Because if you said you love me, why would you do that to me? And you mean, but what about if it was your mother saying it? Not your yeah, father. It was, it's still in the same, my same lens. Like I didn't know how to love because I didn't know accept love. I didn't allow anything to penetrate. It was like I had a wall, right? And so um, it's kind of funny, like the, the book that I'm still scratching away with is titled, I love you, I'm sorry, goodbye, underscore, it's all a lie. When people hear my story, I want you to remember, it's not a poor me, I, I got out of the garbage can. I, you know, I got back to doing the work to recycle the things that have happened to me. And I'm hoping to hear, help as many people as I can. What I, you asked a specific question, like what was missing? Well, I, I didn't have a relationship with God. I didn't have, I didn't have any depth. So I was the person trying to do it all. I was trying to manifest love and relationships and finances. And I was, you know, using woo woo terms for everything. And when I was a young kid, like I felt abandoned in a lot of ways. I've told my mom, I said, you know, mom, growing up, I felt like you weren't around. Well, there was a reason my mom wasn't around. She was trying to figure out how to put food on the table for myself and my sister. Mm -hmm. My mom worked a school job. She, she would go to work at seven and get home at 10 or 11 every single night. My mom was always showing up at my events. My mom, like, it's funny, like how we paint the picture in our head, like there weren't people around. Right. But in reality, if I really put pen to paper and I, I look back, and I'm like, my mom was at my events. I remember when we had the big... Uh, earthquake in the Bay Area in the late 80s, my mom was sitting in the stands. Right. Right. So it's, it's so weird. The tapes that we play um, are the tapes that somehow we think are the true stories. Take and, it a step further even. I just want to interrupt you about your mother. If you, as an adult that puts bread on their table for their children, she was, you said, doing three jobs in order to feed you. What is more love than selflessness to... The but children. I didn't know that because I'm right. a teenager, right? I'm right, just a right. little, I'm a little teenager going, hey, what about me? Why isn't there a home cooked meal? Like, you know, right, you got to right. remember, I grew up in the white picket, perfect neighborhood. I grew up with a husband and a wife. The husband came home, wife ran to the door, grabbed slippers, helped the husband in. Let me go sit you mm -hmm. down. Uh, would you like something to drink? Let me get you a cocktail. Mm -hmm. Let me, I'm, I got to put my apron back on. I'm making you dinner. Mm -hmm. I'm doing your laundry. Like that's the vision and it, and it sucks. I, I am oh. so sad that that's what I remember, but leave it to Beaver. You know, you look at these TV shows growing up and it was like the perfect Lucille ball. Like, you know, mm -hmm. it's like, I love Lucy. It was the perfect little life. And, and the reality was once I took ownership, mm -hmm. once I took ownership for my life, my life got better. And stop blaming anybody or anything. Like I have zero disrespect to my father. I have zero disrespect to my mother. At the end of my dad's life, I was able to hold his hand and tell him I love him. I forgive him. Um, you know, my dad, I think his father molested him. Um, you know, my aunt called me a couple of weeks after my, my dad had passed and said, you know, I just want you to know your dad loved you very much. Um, when we were growing up, it wasn't easy for us. We used to come home from school and they would put us in dog kennels and feed us out of dog bowls. Wow. Um, and, and all of that has helped me to realize, 
um, my mission, right, is like, despite your past, you can change. And people are here to help you walk through your darkness because um, God is light. And I believe if I just stay focused on him and I rest my thoughts in his hands versus mine, everything's going to be better. Can I talk about forgiveness? Because it's something that's very hard for me. And I talk about it a lot, how it's hard for me and letting go. And as you were saying that you told your father that you forgave him, how, how does one do that? I don't care what they went through because part of your message is also leave your past at the front door and create a, a better future. Just because he was molested doesn't mean he's entitled to molest you. Sure. There is no okay. But our past doesn't give us a passage to what we do. We can understand it maybe, but to forgive, how do you... How do you work through that? Well, first off, it didn't do me any good to hold a resentment against my father. I know we know that, good. but it doesn't work. I'm saying we know it's we know it in our head, but our heart doesn't feel that. Yeah. So what I I had to ask myself. So I've really tried probably in the last six years to make this like a practical experience. So walk with me for just a minute through this. What happens if our only job in life is to be a conduit for God to work through us? And so what is a conduit? Let's just use it a pipe, right? Mm -hmm. So every time something happens, I kind of stop. Well, what does that do? It, it causes things to back up, not flow anymore, right? And mm -hmm. eventually things will burst. Mm -hmm. So now I try to say, I don't allow anything to stick with me. I let everything pass through me because in the end, it's not mine anyways, and I can't take it. So all I can do is leave behind everything that I've learned for others to use. And so I spend so much of my time not looking at what happened, but what I did about what had happened. Hmm. And what I was able to do was saying for me to have personal freedom, for me to overcome great depths of obstacles and things that I've experienced. I, I had a stepdad who was the absolute worst absolute worst. I remember one summer I was with Bobby. We were in uh, up in Eugene, Oregon, and I was so mad at my, my stepdad, my mom's second husband. And I took a bunch of spray paint and I went all over brand new homes that were being uh, built. And I spray painted Donza mm -hmm. blank oh all God. over these houses. Oh my God. And I came home, I'm eight or nine years old. I came back and my mom and um, I forget um, Bobby's mom's name said, where have you been? And then my stepdad came in. What are you doing? Well, you know, I'm like, uh, nothing. I was out in the sun. You got freckles all over your face. And, you know, long and behold, I had to take a walk with my stepdad and it's, show him. Oh, my God. And um, I don't know how many houses I had sprayed, but I knew that a whooping was coming. Oh, my God. I knew that, you know, I was going to get beat for what I had done. Oh. And... I remind myself that, and I read it in a passage this morning in, in the book, I wish I could remember it, but we're, we're all dealing with our childhood upbringing in our adult life. We're still, not everybody's figured it all out, but we're mm -hmm. still kind of everything that's kind of happened to us or things we experienced, we're still kind of figuring out in our adult life. No, that's why I say there's no perfectness. There's no one that's figured it out. So people have to realize, I don't want things to hold me back or weigh me down. I want to be free. And the only way to be free is to get rid of anything good, bad, or ugly that's holding me back. And I just want more love. So by letting me say what I said about my father and holding his hand and told him I forgive him and I love him and I accept for you, I accept you. It still can mean that I have some work to do around it, but ultimately I adored my dad. Mm -hmm. Like regardless of, yes, as you said, his past or whatnot, my dad didn't have an easy childhood and it doesn't make it right. doesn't make it wrong. It just makes it the simple fact that he didn't deal with his stuff before it was too late and that stuff caught up to him. And, um, you know, I, I have so many amazing stories of my dad. I just don't have stories of like going out in the backyard and throwing the football or shooting hoops or, uh, you know, spending time, you know, outdoors or whatever. But I have time sitting on Saturday mornings watching cartoons with my dad, mm -hmm. um, watching Star Wars or Star Trek or uh, my dad produced the Miss California pageant for 30 years. Wow. Um, so getting to see my dad be in production and a performer, and that's where I get my love for talent and seeing the world. Mm -hmm. So have you been hurt? Yeah. Have you ever hurt somebody? Yeah. So 
I just use what I believe to be true is, you know, love people and love God and, and, and turn all that stuff over as fast as possible because it's just hurting me more than it's probably even hurting the others. Because, you know, I love what Jim Rohn talks about. He says there's only like seven or eight miserable people in this world. They just seem to move around a lot. <laughs> I don't want to allow anything to hold me back from living out the greatness that has been instilled in myself and in you and everyone else. And so, you know, I, I helped somebody yesterday on the phone and I'm like, God spoke to me through the words that I used, which is pick up the phone and call your mom. It's the only one you get. Mm -hmm. And regardless of what was said to you from her, vice versa, it's like, just get yourself right. So I want you one day when your mom passes that you've said everything you needed to say until mm -hmm. you meet again. Yeah. And forgiveness is a tough thing, but the first part of the word says forgive. And I have to remind myself if I want the this, I have to go forgive. I have to go let go of the stuff holding me back so I can go experience the greatness that I know is inside me. Mm, that's beautiful, by the way. So I get what, what I'm getting from it. And it's really an insight for me that you don't attach the actions to the person. So you're saying that you loved your dad, but you hated what he did mm -hmm. and you didn't make it one. And I think that's huge, huge part of forgiveness is to not attach the actions to the human. And it could be like, I don't know if you love, did you love your stepdad or can you say that he was really not somebody you love? No, you know, it's interesting. My mom had said many years later, um, cause I got reacquainted with my stepbrother. Um, and I used to go and over to my stepdad's house and watch football and see, I grew up in the, the Bay area and I had two choices growing up, uh, in California, you either loved uh, the San Francisco 49ers or you loved the Oakland Raiders. Mm. And I got my love for the Oakland Raiders from my stepdad. Mm -hmm. That's the one thing I love about that. He taught me about football and he got me to enjoy it and that kind of stuff. But no, he used to beat me. He used to beat the crap out of me because, you know, I'd get in trouble at school and said something. And I, you know, our society today wants to label everybody who uh, is a little hyper or a little... Right. You know, I was the kid who would never sit in the front row. I always sat in the back. I got in trouble. My brain didn't develop uh, fast enough. Maybe I didn't talk until I was four. Hmm. Like I take everything that I learned, right? I didn't talk until I was four. I got into a trouble a lot. I was great at telling stories. I went and did a lot of personal work and realized, man, I was making up stories to protect myself because I didn't want people to call my dad gay. And I said, my dad isn't gay. And so I got good at lying. And then, you know, anything you practice long enough, you become. Once I got to a certain point, I found myself in radio broadcasting, living in a booth for six hours of the day. And these stories just manifested in my head, but I'd never shared them with anybody. And then, you know, my wife and I had gotten married. We had one kid, we had another kid on the way and, you know, everything was good. And then six years into the, the marriage, um, I move out and I had all this stuff show up. And I never had dealt with my past. Right. And there's a statement that goes something like this. If you don't deal with it, one day when you're home alone, it's right. going to show up. Mm. And it's going to go, hey, did you miss me? Here's all the stuff that you didn't bring with you. I'm bringing it back to you. And it places this big burden back on you. And so I remember from 13 until 33, I never told anybody my dad molested me. Oh. And when my marriage wasn't right, I used it as, as a, a as a ticket, as a ticket. Yeah, totally. So just to take the attention away from me wow. and go, well, I was molested. This happened, you know, right. and oh my gosh, that's why I had to forgive my dad. That, that my, if there was an issue and I say, speak up, don't hold anything back. Like I did speak up and say what you need to say. Um, I just, I made my dad be a lot worse. It was bad, but I made my dad worse. And that was not fair um, because that was my problem. And I think I, I, I noticed that I had done that earlier in my life, that I wouldn't take personal responsibility for things that had happened. And, and that was something that had happened and I needed to speak up. Um, but I also lived in a day and an age where that wasn't something that you were going to go call your friend on the phone and go, hey, guess what? My dad molested me. It wasn't just mm -hmm. I didn't know how to speak it. And right. today I help people share their story so that they can live in such a way where they can get freedom from their past and not live with the pressure feeling like the society around them is judging them. Look, just turn on the news. I don't care what day of the week it is. Tomorrow, there's a new story that's going to show up. Right. It may last around a week or so, 
but eventually that story is going to be replaced by something else and the attention of all your friends and family are right. on to the next story. Right. So yes, there's a storm, but no storm ever lasts for too long. And our job is to weather the storm by making sure that we, we have what we need to be properly prepared. And today, properly prepared is speak up, you know, pray about it, do work around it, seek counseling, therapist, um, you know, ask for time off if you need to, but really make yourself a priority. And that's the whole movement behind Be Fulfilled, mm -hmm. what you were talking about earlier. My whole movement is all about helping people to see that no matter anything they've gone through or currently going through or will go through, that they have to do it alone and that there's people like myself and others in the world that want to love you and help you and guide you and we're not here to hurt you. But we are human. We will make mistakes. But our intention isn't to hurt you. Our intention is to share some advice and, and knowledge of round stuff that's worked for us. And your job is to take what you're listening to and filter what is applicable to you. And, and in the rooms, we always say this, um, take what you need and leave the rest. Mm -hmm. Like just take what you need and leave the rest. Right. You know, um, it's like going to a buffet. You don't eat the whole buffet. You just take what you need. Right. right. And in doing so, clarity has really come for me to take, you know, I love, I love what I get to do every single day. I talk about fulfillment 24 seven in my life. Right. That's what I get to do. I've, I run a logistics and fulfillment company. Um, I get to come into an office and see an Team am, a team member who's been with me uh, in my journey for 23 years. I've run this company for over 18 years. Right. Ship, so offer, get, ship offer. Yeah. So I get yeah. to see um, fulfillment firsthand. And then I love watching the team around us take the mantra and mission is like, if I can't help you, we'll find somebody who can and then mm -hmm. use that in their language and literally try to help, you know, if it's doesn't get you the deal, but it helps somebody else make money and right. satisfy that customer. And you know, what's crazy is the more that I help people and I'm not their fulfillment choice, the more people will come back around in a couple of years and saying, Hey, right. I think I want to come back. You were always so helpful. It's just kind of funny how if you're just nice to people, nice things happen and nice things happen to bad people too. But I'm just using this as my example. Um, I watched enough of these things take place in my life that I just realized that my job, my obligation, to this world is to leave it better than I found it and to do everything I possibly can to instill, um, you know what, like we're here. And I didn't think there was anybody who really knew me as a child. But you know, when my wife and I got married, um, we had like 250 people. And I want to say there was probably 40 people outside and inside that my parents knew, but didn't know that great. And when it came down to it, they're like, who are these people? And I'm like, oh, I used to clean their gutters and they used to feed me sandwiches. And, wow. uh, you know, they were all these people that were just wow. in the neighborhood that helped take care of me because I used to just walk around, right. you know, hey, what's going on? And by the time I would come home and my mom would have dinner on the table, I probably had two to three dinners on average. Like people just fed me, took care of me. So when you were talking about love, it's taken my brain a few minutes to process it is I didn't really ever know what love was. Real love. It just didn't know. But mm -hmm. my mom loved me. My sister loved me. My stepbrother. I, all these people, I knew that I was loved. I knew that there was love around me. My neighbors loved me. But it took me a while to just process what real love looked like and felt like. Mm -hmm. And today, I, I come from a space of just love. I really do. Let's say that's being the conduit. It's being, being there for people um, when no one else is, it's my obligation. Tony, you want to know what something, do you remember what you read right before we started was all about that when you give in order, because you're just genuinely giving, everything comes back at you, but you were reading. It's that interesting. Yeah. It's the boomerang <laughs> theory, right? When right. you throw out, you get back. If you throw right. out, I'd right. hit in the back of the head and you go, oops, what the just, <laughs> right, <laughs> right, so right. right. Good, it always comes back. Right. I want to touch upon your relationship with your wife because she sounds phenomenal beyond. By the way, he's smiling from ear to ear now <laughs> because to to live with someone like you with all that stuff before the baggage. <laughs> no, I just I I just can't imagine her actually forgiving you and giving you a second chance after three years of and she needed to go through the process of of being okay of of introducing herself to the new Tony, the new and improved, and to believe in you 
and in humankind that there can be change. Yeah. I remember when we were in therapy, I said this the other day, um, she had made a statement. She says, I just want the old Tony back. And I'm like, the heck you do. You don't want the old Tony back. You want the new Tony. The, the new Tony is the person who's going to show up every single day and fight for what is in, is right and important. So my wife, yeah, we reconciled after uh, three years. And I got down on my knees on 12-4 uh, of 08. So about 11 days before I had that call with my mom, and 12 days before, basically, you know, I, I, I really got myself right. And I just, you know, said, hey, I, I don't know where I'm at. I know I've got some work to do. I got a lot of work to do. And she said, okay, you know, um, we got work to do. Take care of the kids. I'm going to run. And I, remem I reminded myself that the person that I married has grown up so much. And today, she was always strong and very independent. But Oh my gosh, I look at my wife today and I just see pure joy, admiration. I see love. I see care. Uh, she lost her sister uh, just about two years ago. Mm. And I watched a woman. We were taking our kid, our oldest, to college at the time and dropping him off. And she, we had got the call that day that her sister was going into hospice. She had um, just a bunch of complications with life. And she was 42 years old. We were done and, you know, like I think every mom has this vision of their kid going off to school and being mm -hmm. there to drop them off. And like, you know, like I could just see it. Like we had right. talked about it for months. She was super excited. And when that call came, she was like, all right, let me, let me, let me do what I can do. I can, I can move Ethan into school. Right. Let's get Ethan into school. Met in the parking lot, gave hugs goodbye. And she didn't cry because I think there was just so much going on. Right, right. She knew that I was there. Mm -hmm. Her partner could help that, you know, the younger brother Owen was there and Ethan and we were being fine. And I called her an Uber and she, I think went on an Uber ride for six hours from where we were at in San Luis Obispo all the way up to like Wal Walnut Creek. And she got out of the car and she walked into the hospice facility and she never left that facility for 30 days. Wow. She just stayed by her sister's side morning, noon, and night. <gasps> was there to to breathe with her sister, walk with her sister, bathe her sister, like, like slept beside her sister, slept, you know, like an inch away from her and just helped her to transition to the next stage of life. She was able to be there. And and I've always I've always admired my wife, but watching somebody go, I mean the husband at the time, the, the mother-in-law and myself, they, we would go home and visit and you know, you get tired and you'd leave. Right. Here's my wife. She just stayed. Wow. And that's how my wife has really done an incredible job helping me to learn how to stay. Um, it's a process. She sees it that it's a yeah. process. It's not a quick thing. No, it's like fight or flight. You've all heard of it. Mm -hmm. um, and the thing that I've been, been working on around it is the magical word called stay. Like when you're experiencing like anxiety and nervousness and all of these things, if no storm lasts forever, this too shall pass. So let the wave of emotion come and go. But I just watched my wife like now we're empty nesting now. So um, both of our kids are in college. Um, we're going to go and spend a month in Europe. Our goal is eventually live uh, there six months out of the year. Mm. Um, we, I look at my wife and I finally realize that's my best friend. I've always known it, but like, I'm like, this is my best friend and we get to grow old together. And I'm like, I'm going to be 47 and she just turned 41. I'm like, we're just young and having fun. Right. Um, so I'm dating my wife seven days a week. I'm, you know, trying to figure out everything I can do to just do more stuff with her. But I look at somebody who should have left, should have run for the hills, should have never came back, should have said, no way, too much damage, no way I'm reconciling no way I'm going to give you another chance. And I am so grateful. And I write it on every card that we give that I said, thank you for saying yes. Thank you for choosing me. Thank you for giving me another chance. Like, thank you. Cause that's for me, what true love is. Mm -hmm. We are going to, we're going to make mistakes. We're going to fail. We're going to do things. Mm -hmm. But at the end of it, like just she's, she's, I, I get excited and smile and laugh because I know my, my wife's like love, you know, language. 
Um, she just likes to be told these things. She doesn't like me to speak of these things. She just mm-hmm. likes, like, I love to tell her. I love to look at her. And I mean, right. we're just having fun. We're, I, I'm a couple weeks into being an empty nester. And so we're just, we're just learning new things about each other that, right. that have always been there, but we're just, you know, right. um, you have time to oh be. Oh gosh, I have so much time. You know, I have, my time has time for the first time in a long time. <laughs> no, you have time to be. Yes, I, I do. And that's, that's where the be fulfilled part right. really comes into play, right? Like right. there's nowhere to get. So why don't you be where you're at? Be present, right. be, be in the moment, be, you know, be all of these wonderful things. And so, yeah, we, we're, we're loving life and we've got two dogs at home. So I guess we have dogs. Um, but they're, they're really like little kids in a lot of ways. We have a 14 year old and a two year old. And so we're, <laughs> we're keeping busy. Wow. She sounds remarkable. She really sounds amazing. And but she's basically, um, a reflection of what you said that she, she loved you, but she didn't like your actions. So yep. she forget, I get, but maybe she saw that maybe you were a role model in that and she wanted she it back. On, she went on two missions. She went on two missions to Uganda and I remember when we were leaving, I had two great conversations. My pastor really helped a lot in one of these conversations. It was just one of my posts the other today said, love is a decision. Mm -hmm. Love is a decision. You have to choose it every single day. Like if you're fighting with your significant other and you're like, well, I'm going to break up or I'm going to get a divorce and I don't want to be around you. Guess what you're going to do? You're going to become that thing. You say it long enough, you, you believe it. And then next thing you know, so love was a decision. We just made it. And um, she was getting ready to go on a mission. And he, he looked at both of us like, you guys need to forgive each other. And you need to like, say you love each other. And I'm like, all right, I love you. I forgive you. And you know, next thing you know, four or five days in the phone rings, I don't know what time of day it was. And she just says, I just got to tell you that I forgive you. Wow. But you could hear it was depth of a lot of time. And she had said, she was able to do that. I had a bunch of women praying over her in Uganda and just knew that it was right for us to have a chance to really grow in our marriage. Um, Mm -hmm. We had to, it doesn't mean that she forgot, just means that she knew that she needed to forgive so that we could move forward. Because if it's kind of like, how are you going to survive if you've got a giant dumpster attached to someone's behind and it's holding them back, but you're light as a feather moving forward. Right. Like if I'm going to walk in life with my partner, we're going to walk side by side. We're going to deal with this. I'm going to be pushing the dumpster with her and not making her do it by herself. Right. I think she's brave as anything. Like people would say, Oh, why would she take you back? Well, she like, they would might see it as weakness, but it's really bravery beyond courage that she's saying, I'm choosing love. I'm choosing forgiveness. I'm choosing work. I'm choosing the now versus the past. Yeah. And we've done a lot of work together. I mean, and it's always work. Every 21 day. years of marriage, 21, we just celebrated 21. So yeah. you can do math in your head. Really for, for me in a lot of ways, it's really been 11, mm-hmm. right? Cause it's really been like this, this, person who now um, is very comfortable despite everything. Um, Mm -hmm. And I want to mention this because I think it's really helpful. Um, You're not weak for asking for help. It's actually a sign of your greatness. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what I didn't know then. I know better today and I can pick up the phone and call somebody and say, I'm struggling. Hey, what do you think about this? I can talk to my wife about difficult things and we can just learn that we're going to figure this stuff out together. We're just going to figure it out because that's kind of what we're supposed to do. And today with Google, WebMD, you've got all of these these pieces that are like sitting in front of you that can guide you. Doesn't necessarily mean you have to take all of them and use them. But I know today I I have resources and tools, and uh, in two seconds I can find a recovery meeting, and and you know a couple of minutes I could I could find. a therapist. I get, you know, like I could do work today. I could figure mm-hmm. out things and it seems weird, but like 10, 15 years ago, that was a, that was a yellow page just flipping the book and trying mm-hmm. to figure out stuff. And now mm-hmm. today people share reviews and things. And so I, I just want to tell you, I appreciate the opportunity to share, you know, with my wife and my, my mom and my, my dad, and my sister and my boys and everybody in my life. I'm more present today because there's nothing else that matters than being connected in a relationship where you feel honored, loved, open, and you have the ability to know that the person that you're speaking to 
is absolutely just mindful of where you're at and has tools and resources today that if you're looking for, it can guide you towards the, the solution that you're looking for, for the problem or ailment or the answer that you seek. Right. And it's a choice that we need to make every day that we're choosing to rise above, to seek help, as you said. And you're very, um, I want to wrap this up because I know you got to go, but you always say that you surround yourself with mentors. You're never good enough to be alone. You're always with your men- with people that you look up to, people that motivate you. And I think that is so key, especially in mental health, because we can fall so fast. Like our highs and our lows are, are constant. We don't have like the regular flat. We're high and low and high and low. So when we surround ourselves with mentors constantly, and we never feel good enough to be on our own, that's no. when we succeed. I just recently in the world lost a great with Dr. Sean Stevenson and uh, Sean was my mentor yeah. and one of my coaches mm-hmm. and you know, Sean was love. Yeah. Sean had so much love and I'm going to uh, his memorial this, uh, this weekend. I was one in a billion who got to see his video views go viral. I was one in a million who got to be at his many, you know, conferences and Mm -hmm. speeches and stages to hear just his powerful message. I was one of a hundred thousand that was able to see a man have numerous stories like the one I'm sharing of a person who just gave and loved, um, you know, of the thousands uh, that are going to be there this weekend. I'm honored. And, you know, he, he got a chance. He, he wrote the forward to the be fulfilled journal. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. um, It's the most important thing you'll ever do is get somebody to help you in your journey. Um, Coach, mentor, therapist, somebody um, to help you unpack your thoughts and your ideas to get them out of your head and down on paper. And he was a therapist and he was, he was incredible. And we were taking my son to college. It was Ethan and myself. We were driving from Colorado to California when I got the phone call. And I was able to be there and my son, you know, he's 20 and just leaned over and he just gave me a big hug and he just said, I'm so sorry. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, Sean would want me to celebrate with stories and laughter and joy and to remind the world of his mission to rid the world of insecurity, to go Mm -hmm. help the world to be a better place by being love and impacting it. So I'm just honored to carry his message, to have his name attached to the journal and for when people get it to read his story. Um, Love is the most powerful gift and Sean showed me love and was able to help me through learning a lot of who I was and who I was holding myself from becoming because I was afraid of love and through the process of just knowing him for four quick years. Uh, he was able to impact my life and th- anybody who ever comes in contact with me again will always have Sean right there with him. Yeah. And I remember the first time I saw him on stage, I was in the depth of a depression, depth. And I was looking for something to keep me up. So I was, I, I when he came on stage, I was like, okay, he's a therapist. He's definitely have it harder than I do. Like definitely. Um, okay. And I left there feeling alive alive because he he gave that feeling of no matter what comes your way you have the choice and you have the obligation to actually change it you have it find the way ask for help and and when when i saw that he passed away if by the way can i share something with you yeah i emailed him a week before he passed away will you be on my show a week before i'm dying to know where that email went and I'm like, wh- I-, I thought I was in a dream when I saw that they posted that he passed away. Because I-, I-, I didn't hear that he was sick because he wasn't, I mean, he was sick his whole life, but he was living life every single moment. What with all of it, he was just living. And and I felt like the the the, the universe lost the light, a shining uh, it, light. It, it lost, yeah, from the, from his appearances and the Dalai Lama, late night television presidents, spoken on stage his book uh get off your butt it's a yeah. great book if anybody's wanting a, a good mm-hmm. book to go grab grab that yeah. tony robbins wrote the forward to that book yeah and yeah. 
yeah. I mean, all I can say is that I get to do everything in my power to make sure that his light stays lit. And right. That's my obligation um, to Mindy and, and to the world is that somebody who loved despite everything. And he used to, he called it, he goes to this container. And if you've ever heard of him, he's pounding yes, his chest. Yes, yeah. It's just a container, right? Right, right. It can't contain me. You're right. Um, he, you know, he's, I, I knew like the moment he passed, I took a few minutes, mentally just saw him in heaven, having a dance party. Mm. <laughs> just, you know, <laughs> Loving just, everyone, right? Everybody. Yeah. And, and yeah. that's how we keep people alive. We share their stories. We share their messages. He was coming, he was coming to stay at my house. We were working on a new project. We oh, just wow. started talking about it. Like, <gasps> he was coming to speak. I was supposed to be a guest wow. on his podcast the next day. Wow. So, all of these things happen. And this morning as I'm taking my vitamins off to the left in my, my uh, little pantry is a little note from Sean that he wrote. Mm -hmm. And I have pictures in my office and talking about him today, I'm filled with joy. At first I was this, this, you know, um, goosebumps all over my body. Mm -hmm. Cause I know Sean's with me. I know Sean is with everybody. Sean is this bright light. Right. And so I appreciate you sharing. And, and just when I hear mentors, I just think I, I, Sean was such a vital yeah. mentor in my life and will continue to be. Now I look at him like as a, a force ghost, like in Star Wars at the very end. You know, <laughs> he's like my Yoda. I always, yeah. I told the story at one of his conferences. I said, you're my Yoda. I'm your Luke. And, you know, thank you for showing me how to be a powerful force. Like, thank you for sharing that yeah. with me. And that's, you know, what I need to go do to the rest of the world is tell people that they, they have the same opportunity. I'm not uniquely, you know, any different than anyone. I'm just uniquely doing something today with my talent. And when we live every day out of our comfort zone, like he pushes us to do, we're continuing his legacy and his memory. Oh. We're keeping him alive. So when it's hard, we have to just remember his words and we're like, okay, Sean, we're doing this for you because you taught us and you're not here to tell us that tomorrow on a podcast, on a stage or whatever, we're going to remember it. And that's our thank you to him. And that's continuing his legacy because he was a therapist and he meant so much mental health in his life. Yeah, so much. And and he never let anybody feel shame of what they were going through. He just gave them power to overcome it. No, I'm glad just to know that there was thousands of people, tens of thousands and messages just like, just like mine. I yeah. love seeing how many people he impacted. And, and I think I was talking to a friend of mine the other day and said, that's the legacy I want to leave behind. Yeah. I right. want the world to speak yes. like that about me. That yes. would be just incredible. Yeah. I think I'm going to wrap up with something that you write on your website. With the right support, you can achieve anything. With the right support, you can achieve anything, which means always ask for help, always get support and have them around you because you're never strong enough to really be long lasting forever. We are strong enough to heal ourselves, but we're not strong enough to be alone. We need community. We need each other. So I love that message. And it's such a powerful message. And the Be Fulfilled Journal, by the way, if anybody wants it, where do they find it, Tony? Uh, BeFulfilledJournal.com. Mm -hmm. And if they put in your name... You can go ahead and, and uh, I'll, I'll give you a nice big discount. I won't tell you what it is. I'll just tell you that it'll be it'll be a big surprise. And you um, said a new one's coming out. What's the difference? So a new one, I, so I have two. So I was able to take the Be Fulfilled Journal um, and really build a 12-week course, like a journey to fulfillment for it. So I built a course and a whole program around it, online videos, support, community, and everything. And I loved what I was doing with it. And then I realized you know what, I'm still this big advocate for recovery. And I, I, that's part of my message. And so a dear friend of mine, Anna David, and I started talking and I said, Hey, how would you like to, you know, you know, create this journal with me? And she's like, sure. When, when do we start? Like, what do, what do you want to do? And so we built um, a new journal called Be Fulfilled Recovery. There's a wait list right now for it at BeFulfilledRecovery.com. Um, and we are going to launch this to the world. And it's to help people in all walks of life, not just in, I'm in recovery from alcoholism. It's like you're in recovery from cancer, you're in recovery from a breakup in a marriage or a divorce, your recovery, you know, with losing a child, whatever it may be. Our message is to help you deal with the process and help to get you on your path. So mental, um, 
awareness and help. It's all of these things. And so I'm working on that. And then I have another one coming out called Be Fulfilled Marriage. And I'm really just going down the road to uh, take what I love so so what's so powerful for me, which is like, let me take my life lessons, right? So chase mm-hmm. the winds, study the lessons and never give up. Mm-hmm. And then in the, in the middle, like how we started your show today, if you remember, right. we talked about fantasy, right. possibility, and reality. So these were fantasies. These were ideas and thoughts. And now right. we were putting pen to paper. They're becoming possibilities to share about them, talk about them on here, and then working on the steps needed to make them a reality. And so, you know, my goal at the end of the day is I've got the new spiritual walk journal that's being worked on. That's the fourth one that's going to come out talking to rabbis, talking to uh, preachers, monks, like I want to talk and and have your version of God. Like I want to learn, but the real message behind it is how do I end discrimination? Mm. That's what I'm working on because I believe when you say, you know, I, you're a Jew and I'm a Christian, your first thing is like, go to defense and you're like, well, this is why I believe. And I'm like, that's great. But I, let's imagine if for a moment we just figured out how to be love. Right. And so right. these are the these are the important things that I'm up to. All Very on the excited. Side. All on the side. Why I go run a business. How? How do you have so much time? How much you, do you sleep? Four hours a day. I have since I was 18 years old. Four hours a night? Yep. Four to five. That's it? Yep. Wow. But when I need a nap, my wife knows, don't bother me. I'm sleeping. <laughs> wow. Wow. And I do like everybody else. If you hustle for a long period of time. I do get exhausted and I will take a couple of days off from work and I'll just be sick in bed. Like I, I work you myself. Crash. You yeah, crash. Just, you yeah. just crash. Wow. By the way, he's not only a giant in his heart, he's a giant physically. He's like huge. I remember the first time I saw him, I'm like, you're double my size. He's a giant. He's really a giant. And there's so much to learn from him. It's really incredible. And we can go on and on. We'll have you again after one of the big journals come on that we can um, promote it and have people um, actually use it in their life because I think it's going to be so helpful. And part of it is also gratitude. I know you. we always talk about gratitude. Tony, so much of his recovery talks about gratitude and how we have to be grateful. Tony, I have one more question, uh, two more questions before we leave. First okay, of all, I'm ready. First of all, you talk about your friends a lot. Are you still in business with those two other friends, your best friends? Are they still part of your life? Yeah, they, yeah, they are. They're in my life. Um, and biz- business is like my most important thing outside of my marriage, right? So I love what I get to do and how I get to show up in the world. Um, yeah, friend, friends are everything. I, I literally, my favorites on my phone list, I rotate all people in because I, I've been blessed with a lot of friends. I have my elementary school, junior high, my high school, my college, my young adult life and my friends now. And, and when I look back and reflect, I'm like, man, I am lucky. Mm. They should all be gone, but I'm so lucky that they're all here and they're helping me to become a better person every day. Wow. That's incredible. Tony, what does hope mean to you? Hope. I love that word. And I like that people instill hope in me, just like my buddy John did when he knocked on my door and told me my life had meaning and purpose. His hope and his prayer for me was that I would do the work. Hope is, is that whatever it is that you've got going on in your world or your life right now, that you make you a priority, that you become the most important thing in your physical life so that you can be there for the people in your world. My hope is, is that every person listening today will actually go home and look at themselves in the mirror tonight and smile at them and say, I like that person I see. And if you're not where you want to be, realize that there's people like me who are willing to help you. You can shoot me an email. You can visit my site. You don't have to buy a darn thing from me. Um, The goal is, my hope has always been the same, is that there is more good in this world than there is bad. And that there is more amazing humans out there willing to leave an impact and a legacy on the world. And I hope that you seek those people and find those people. And, um, you know, my faith is, uh, plays a big role in my life. I wouldn't be here today without, I call it an angel knocking on my door. Mm -hmm. So my hope is, is that no matter where you're at in your journey, no matter what you're doing, if you want, if you want to do something better, um, I hope that you know that you can. And if you want to be inspired and fulfilled, go to Tony's, um, Facebook community because uh, he's always motivating. Sometimes he's funny, but we, most of the time he's very um, in depth, motivating and inspiration. It's, like inspiration. Yeah. After a while, you got to keep applying it. <laughs> I love that. I love that. So 
He's on, on Facebook, Be Fulfilled. It's the Be Fulfilled community, right? That's correct. Yep. Yeah. And you can find him at BeFulfilled.com. And he his business, if you want to do business with him, ShipOffer.com, right? Ship ShipOffers.com. Offer. That's correct. Yeah. If you want to do fulfillment, not for your heart, but for products. By the way, is that a play on word? Yes. Be Fulfilled comes from the idea that I wanted to, um, we wanted to help you be fulfilled. We right. wanted you to be fulfilled, right? So then I kind of played off and used the whole kind of idea to help people both be personally and professionally fulfilled in their life. I so love that's that. where that comes from. I love that. Tony, thank you so much for giving me your time, your story, your inspiration, and a lot to think about in my life and tips of how to overcome pain struggles and how to never give up. I really, really appreciate your time. And hopefully we'll be seeing each other soon. In yeah, person. you're going to be on my podcast. We're going to rock a show together. <laughs> okay. Oh, he has a podcast too. He has so much going on. You, your head can spin, but um, that's why he sleeps only four hours a night. And please tell your wife that I admire her beyond. I never met her, but I would love to meet her one day because she sounds like a phenomenal well, human being. She'll be at more things now because we have less responsibilities. And so now she can come travel. So I, I'm so excited that all my friends that have heard me talk about Amber get to spend more time being with Amber because she'll yeah. be there. So, And I, I'm excited to meet her in person. And I have a feeling that we'll have a very long conversation. So <laughs> prepare her in advance. Anyway, have a, have a great day, everybody. Thank you for listening. And remember, there's always hope. There's always change and never give up on yourself and always forgive. Thanks. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you for joining us and taking the time to listen. I really appreciate it. Please hit the subscribe button so you can hear further episodes. If you are listening to us on iTunes, please leave feedback and ratings below. Let us know if there's any topic that you would like to hear from us in the future. Bye till next time.